As a player at North Melbourne, he was handy and serviceable. 120 games in eight seasons, including a grand final. As a coach, he was to go on to become coach of North's Team of the Century, ahead of the great Ron Barassi. Welcome to Open Mic, Dennis. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mike. I'm glad to be here. Now, you're now Dennis Pagan, real estate agent. That's correct, yeah. How's yeah. business? Terrific. In, you know, really, in a price-sensitive market, tough times, we're doing pretty well and sort of in partnership with my son, Ryan, and really enjoying every moment. You're missing the football involvement? Um, look, I did there, you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah, really wanted to be involved, but uh, couldn't find an opening. So uh, went back to school, got my full licence and... Um, did you really? Yeah, um, killed me. It did. It took five months and, you know, exams and assignments and that. Yeah. But, you know, I said to Ryan, if we're going to go in, we'll both do that. Ryan and, being your son? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And he did too. And uh, we operate our uh, Stockdale Lego franchise out at Essendon and it's, uh, it's going well. Dennis, you played, let's talk about your playing career. You played in the back pocket in North Melbourne's 1974 losing grand final team against the Tigers. Daryl Cumming was the permanent small forward. Kevin Bartlett was the rover occasionally going forward. They kicked one goal between them and you never played again. What happened? Oh, look, I was, I was an ordinary conveyance as a uh, player. <laughs> uh, I was pretty slow. Um, got the most out of myself. And it was just, just the way they see things. Uh, you understand it when you become a coach and people have preferences and, and thoughts on individuals and whether they're right or whether they're wrong. Um, you know, I, I, I'm happy that I tried my hardest uh, when I was a player and uh, didn't achieve a hell of a lot, but hung in there. You started your coaching career at Yeovil in the then VFA. How did that come about? Did you At that point, did you always have this desire to be a coach? Well, when you finish, probably it's the next transition. You want to be involved, you love the game. You know, I love football, you know, from uh, a, a young boy, 10 years of age. It was just a natural progression. I wanted to be involved, um, captain and coach for a couple of years. Did you go into coaching with someone as your model, someone that you thought you'd try to emulate? Yeah, I was always a David Parkin fan, a Tommy Hafey fan. I loved the way Tommy uh, had those Richmond sides playing in the, in the well, the, I suppose you'd say the, uh, um, in the seventies with uh, you know Royce at uh, uh, centre half forward, get it in quick to him and, and that sort of stuff. You and, might have and, adopted that philosophy with one of your well, guys I'm later sure, in life. I'm sure there were plenty of uh, bits and pieces of Tommy's philosophy in my views. And you didn't mention Brass, who was oh, your Brass, coach well, at yeah, North. Yeah, Brass was a, a very good coach. I'm not denying that for a moment. What did yeah. you take from Brass? Um, in, in your arsenal as a coach? Uh, you know, uh, look, probably the biggest lesson I've probably learnt in life, and I reckon it's probably the biggest weakness in the Australian culture at the moment, is about accepting responsibility for your own actions. No regrets, no excuses, no alibis, never point the finger, never blame anybody else. And, you know, I've lived by that, and that's probably the biggest lesson I've learnt in life, not only in football, and that come from Ron Barassi. Mm. Barassi is an amazingly mellow figure now. I mean, he's just, everyone loves him, and, and uh, but... It was different to Brass the coach, wasn't it? Particularly in his time at North Melbourne. I mean, he, he was pretty caustic, wasn't he? Oh, well, he was. He, but times have changed. You know, in those days, you'd get a burst for looking sideways, and yeah. blokes didn't even yeah. worry about it. Now you look at sideways at a player, they want to want to go and speak to the solicitor about it. <laughs> what took you back to North, to the under-19s? Um... Look, it was just one of those things that happened. Ron Joseph came and had a chat to me. Johnny Brim was coaching um, the under-19s at the time. Barry Cable was senior coach. They wanted me to come back and help out with the under-19s, and I did that for a year. And then I, had, I really wanted to coach in my own right after having two years at Yarraville as playing coach, captain coach. Um, I wanted, and then John Ibram, to his credit, he said, look, Dennis is the man to be coaching the under-19s, not me. And he went and told uh, Barry Cable and Ron Joseph, I think it was down in Albert Mantello's office in, uh, in West Melbourne there, and uh, yeah. next minute I was under-19 coach and had the job for uh, another nine years, I think. Do you know how many games you coached at the under-19 level? Um, no, I don't, Michael. Mm. A lot, Ten years worth. 238. 238. Amazing, isn't it? Your strike rate was unbelievable. You got any idea what it was? Oh, I suppose mid-60s or something. 60s. No, don't be modest, Dennis. It doesn't become you. It was 81%. 81. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, that was nine successive grand finals. Yeah, well, did you? It must have been frustrating though to be taking this football, these kids, uh, to grand finals year after year, and not exciting any interest from any club about a senior job. Well, different, different days then, different times. Um, I think one person made the comment one day: "Have you ever seen a, an under nineteen coach um, become a successful AFL coach?" I hope it wasn't me, was it? I can't remember who it was, <laughs> and my answer to that was: "Have you ever seen a, a ex successful under nineteen coach get an opportunity as a senior yeah. coach?" Yeah. You never got the opportunity in those days, and you know the people who pick coaches. Um, there's some amazing decisions being made over the journey. Mm, they have. When the under-19s finished, closed down, 
You didn't even get the North Reserves jobs, did you? You had to go to Essendon. That's correct, yeah. Um, uh, Schimmel was in charge and John Law um, stayed on with the, uh, with the reserves. And look, those sort of things happen. I'm oh, oh, sure I was disappointed at the time and disappointed the way the, the news was uh, uh, delivered. But How yeah, was the news delivered? I think it was at the senior best and fairest. Uh, it said that Dennis is moving on. And I said, well, that's good. I was sitting with my wife. I said, yeah, yeah we're moving on, darling. Let's, <laughs> let's get our stuff and go. Twelve months later, North go to Adelaide, play in a pre-season game, get smashed. Come back to Melbourne, Wayne Schimmelbush loses his job, you're appointed at North. Must have been a tumultuous time for you. Well, I can remember like it was yesterday. I think it was the 5th of March. It was a Wednesday evening. Mm. Uh, at that stage, I was working with NZI Insurance as a as a uh, agency manager inspector. Mm -hmm. Drove into my driveway. I'm being 5.30, the phone rang. I can still remember it. Remember those big mobile phones like Blue Stone yeah. Pictures on your console? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I looked at it and I thought, gee, it's been a hard day. Should I answer this? And being the uh, conscientious insurance in, uh, <laughs> inspector that I was, picked the phone up. Dennis Pagan, NZI Insurance, and I was a director of the North Melbourne Football Club asking me would I like to have an interview for the North Senior Job. Um, and well, you know, I sort of tried to be nonchalant and laid did back. Did you know Shimmer was gone at that point? Yeah, I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did. Mm -hmm. I was pretty common knowledge. Um, uh, and they got onto it pretty quickly. And I think they, there were uh, three uh, coaches involved. I think the there was um, Dermot Brereton, who I thought was probably six to four favourite, and probably Rodney Ede, probably eleven to two, and Dennis Pagan probably sixty six to one. <laughs> so, but look, they you know, get up occasionally the outsiders, don't well, they? Well, they do, especially in, a, in, a, in small fields. You're back at North in 1993. It was yep. the start of eight successive years in the finals, including two flags. It was an amazing run, wasn't it? Well, it was. Um, now, it was sort of, it was, I, I, had, I don't sort of dwell or go backwards much in my life, and I was out we're, uh, into the financial uh, year with our staff last night, and was in a hotel across the road from our uh, office in Essendon. And I looked up, and Fox Footy was on, and there was the uh, 94 preliminary final, the first mm. time I've ever seen it. And uh, you think, gee, it just goes so quickly your it whole does. life. Yeah. Passes in front of your eyes. Probably, um, <coughs> you probably missed a final, missed a premiership in um, 98. You agree with that? Yeah, no should have won that. It. Yeah, but should you have won ninety nine? I mean, does it level out? Oh, I think it does. We yeah. we weren't the best side in ninety nine. No, Essendon, yeah, Essendon were, were by yeah. a country mile. Yeah, I can still remember uh, the bombers before the preliminary final was played. People were queuing up, going right down Napier Street, around the corner <laughs> into Fletcher Street, and I thought to myself, "Gee, this is amazing." So, whether that had any impact on the play? So they were queuing up for grand final tickets. tickets. Yeah, and they hadn't earned their, their way into it yet. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that, that's only the supporters, yeah. but that yeah. was you know I just wonder whether that had any effect on the the players. I, look, I thought in 94 we were beaten by uh, Geelong with the last kick of the day. I reckon if we had got into the grand final against West Coast, I reckon we could have uh, done a pretty good job mm. there too. Mm. But wasn't wasn't uh, meant to be. You know, 98, I think we kicked well, a lot of points. Might have you been did, 15 yeah. points to half time. Yeah. Um, and, and we came in and all the staff were excited. And I could sense uh, this wasn't uh, looking good for the Kangaroos and it, and it came to fruition in the second half. How deeply did 98 cut, Dennis? It did. We were the best. We were the best uh, side in the competition that year by a country mile. But look, the reality is in AFL football, the best side doesn't win. The best side on Grand Final Day wins, and we weren't the best side on Grand Final Day. Two flags from your coaching career. Is that just reward for uh, for the teams you had and the way you coached? I always remember what Kevin Shirdy uh, says. You just don't realise how hard they are to win. Mm. I reckon we probably should have won one more, but we we sh we shouldn't have won uh, ninety nine. Yeah, so, that's what I said. So yeah. you should have won ninety eight, and, yeah. and and probably not won ninety nine. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. yeah, that 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 was my thought on it. Yeah. yeah, you ruled with an iron fist, Dennis, didn't you? I don't think there's any doubt about that. All yeah. your players would be of the same view, Even the, and you've got lots of them that declare their undying love for you. But you were tough. Well, I was. Yeah, I was strong. It was probably the environment we brought up with. But you know, you, you can't deny the fact that we didn't have a, a real genuine care and interest for the people we were uh, involved with, um, and the, the the players, the, the kangaroos, were just a, a, an enormously resilient and tough bunch of. They were men, mm. um, and they were getting results, and they could see it. There was probably a lot of humour there, but um, maybe look, it's, it's a funny thing, you know. If you had a big white wall of uh, um, just been painted, and they were your uh, good things, and someone comes in with a black texture colour and puts a dot on the wall, people remember the black dot on the wall, yeah, and they don't remember the, the good things you do. So, yeah. you know, I, th I think I was balanced. Sure, I was hard. I was tough. I'd been brought up in a in a very tough environment, but um, I reckon I was fair. 
Um, but look, that's for other people to judge, not me. If uh, if they didn't um, uh, like it, they wouldn't have played for you the way they did the Kangaroos. Mm. When you're installed as coach at North Dennis, you turned to a 21 year old bloke who you'd coached at under 19 level by the name of Wayne Carey and made him captain. In 1993, he was Wayne probably, I think, in your own words, the best player that you've seen and coached, and he's my best player. But did you have a special set of rules for, for Wayne? Was he allowed to almost do do and come and go as he wanted? No, he wasn't. And that, that's one thing that probably rolled me a bit. A lot of people used to say that. And a lot of people say a lot of things about Badger. <clears throat> you know, you speak to Wayne, some of the things that m maybe not everything got out that, uh, well, that I said to him and, and vice versa and, and this sort of stuff. Um, but look, it's, it's, look, the opinions are like noses. Everyone's got one. <laughs> and, you know, every, a lot of people say a hell of a lot of things about individuals and a lot of things that even appear in your newspaper at times and, and the one down in Spencer Street that are, that are incorrect. But what do you do? Don't explain, don't complain, just get on with the job. And So there was no exemptions for Wayne because he was such a good player? Well, I can't, I can't remember any examples. Well, uh, your players, the, the teammates used to say, you used to say to them, no grog, right? <laughs> no grog between the week, uh, during the week. And some might sort of say, well, the duck can have him. And your response allegedly was, well, the duck can do that and come out oh. and he'll train the house down and be best on the ground next week. You blokes can't do that. That's so far from the truth. I'd like that's to not know. right. That, well, it's not. Look, Didn't I, they Wayne all, drink a lot when he played? They always used to drink a lot. They never. We played a lot of Friday night games. They'd mm. go away for the weekend. And, and I'm sure Wayne was a good drinker. And I'm sure mm. I could probably name you 10 others. They may not like me saying that. But uh, what, what, the, the thing that I, I, I come to uh, uh, accept was, OK, if you have a good weekend. Just make sure in the training track Monday morning mm. you train well. And I never had any, any queries with any of those blokes. And, and more importantly, Wayne, because he, he led from the front. He did that. He did. did that. And he, he was just sensational. He wouldn't pick it. Mm. You, you go out and have a, a couple of beers with Wayne now. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to stay there too long. I no. tell you, <laughs> you'll find yourself sitting on the floor. <laughs> Dennis, do you accept any responsibility for the events that ended the relationship between Wayne Carey and North Melbourne? I mean, he, he, to, on the outside looking in, it looked like he was the victim of a culture that he could do what he liked at the footy club. Yeah, look, uh, people take your greatest strength and hit you over the head with it. Um, did I have anything to do with the the, uh, the situation that exploded? I suppose. Um, look, it's something you don't even want to talk about. I don't think I don't think I, I did. Um, you know, it was one of those things that happened in life. It was terrible. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure if people could change events, they certainly mm. would have. But mm. they were they were out of uh, the, the control of uh, individuals, and only one or two people could uh, could have changed it. And you were extremely close to both those people. We're talking about Wayne Carey and Anthony Stevens, weren't you? Left you in an invidious position, didn't it? Well, it did. And you know, I couldn't take sides with it. You know, mm. I support Anthony was at the club. He was a new captain. Um, we supported him. You know. Uh, Wayne went into virtually in, into uh, into hiding, and I spoke to him about it. And look, there were there was things that um, occurred that shouldn't. It's amazing every time there's a uh, an indiscretion, they always bring that up. It must be terrible for uh, Anthony to see that. Um, yeah. Um, I just hope that Anthony get onto onto his life, and he's you know he's just proven what a a great ambassador and, and a wonderful. Uh, player he was to lead um, the Kangaroos and you know the, the way he did that it was was just terrific after those sorts of issues. Mm. It was almost a mortal blow for the footy club I mean you left 12 months later did that have any impact on your decision to, to leave North Melbourne? No uh, my contract was up I would have preferred to stay at North Melbourne. Would my, you? Yeah no doubt about that my contract was uh, up for renewal um, they were making uh, ridiculous offers uh, at the stage you know we'll, we'll, yeah, how many people come to the game we'll pay you a dollar for every person that comes through is that and, literally true yeah I've still got the contract at home now the offer at home now and I started to think gee this is funny and I probably made the mistake then of uh, um, I had a bit of a uh, um, uh, Ron Joseph was no longer my manager at mm. that stage. If Ron Joseph had been my manager at that stage, I still would have been at North. And I got the impression that people thought I was too autocratic. Um, they needed to rest a bit of the... People uh, inside the club. Yeah, mm. uh, rest the uh, balance of power back. 
and they did that and, um, you know, made, made, made me an offer um, that I had to refuse. And at that stage, Carlton was sort of there knocking at the right sort of uh, time. People said it was for money. I think the first year at Carlton, my paycheck was 25000 uh, less at Carlton than it was at the, the Kangaroos the preceding year. So nor- <coughs> North wound you back, did they? Their new offer was for less money than what you'd coached previously? Oh, substantially less. Yeah. Substantially. Do you want to tell us what it was? No, I don't. None of your business. How much do you get paid? Not a lot. Oh, yeah? Well, I was getting paid okay in those days. (laughs) So the deal was a lower uh, base fee and a commission on the number of people that turned up to watch North. Well, it was that, and there was a whole host. I can't remember it now. And I I just uh, um, uh, thought, oh, well, it's obvious that uh, they don't want me here. Is that right? I mean, that's my understanding from other people at North, and you know who that was, I mean, Jeff Walsh and people like that, was that uh, the, the offer was, uh, was very significant. Well, I, I don't want to uh, beg to differ, but I've got it in black and writing, mm. uh, black and white at home, and it mm-hmm. wasn't. Um, and, you know, the offer wasn't made till uh, the season was over, virtually. You, you had a 65% win rate at North. It just seemed to a lot of us incongruous that you two, the two parties, you and the North Melbourne Football Club, would part company. Well, at that stage, and there, as I said earlier, there were people on the board and people um, um, in the in the football club who thought I had too much control mm. over things. Mm. And, you know, it was probably right. But we're having a lot of success in those days. And, and if sometimes autocratic uh, regimes are successful, and if they're successful, why would you want to change it? They changed it. And there hasn't been a lot of success since. No, there hasn't. No. After the break, Dennis, the Carlton days. The move to Carlton, it turned out to be a disaster, didn't it? <laughs> That's the biggest understatement of all time. Mm. Yeah, it certainly did. From day one, um, you know, I can, remember, um, I can remember my wife saying to me next morning, she said, are you sure you've made the right decision here? <laughs> Based uh, on what? Oh, just, just, you know, it was sort of the way it ended at North Melbourne. That wasn't given any publicity in, in those days. It was more or less pagans gone for money. And I didn't, you know, as I said, I didn't get up in the media and discount it or anything at that stage, just just moved on with it and, you know, from the moment I went to Carlton, you know, from, you know, losing your picks, um, a very a very public sort of, um, um, you know, clash between league heavyweights, Graham Samuel and John Elliott and then mm. get those uh, uh, fines and uh, sanctions and that sort of stuff and, you know, from, the, from day one I think Carlton were the oldest list, uh, the highest paid. Um, the Did play- you not see that though when you, when you took the decision? Decision. Yeah, but Weren't I thought the warning bells ringing then. Yeah, but there was there wasn't too many other people offering jobs, by the way. Mm, um, mm. And I didn't, I wasn't uh, big on the media in those days. And, uh, <laughs> no, uh, n- n- I didn't vouch for that. <laughs> yeah, um, and you know, I took Carlton because you know Daniel Wells and and uh, Goddard. 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 Yeah, yeah. That, that would have been a handy two to start yeah, with. True. And, and we could have built from there. And gee, when that happened, and you know, people saying to me, well, we've got to bring some professionalism back to the club, and the players had to take a, a pay cut, and I delisted probably 15 blokes, you know, um, at the you know, end of the first pre-season. It wasn't a recipe for success, and you can imagine um, the, the division um, and factions and disunity mm. at a, a club like Carlton, and it was just the whole place was probably split into three or four sections, mm. and you wouldn't have matter what happened, you couldn't have been successful. I can still remember one of your colleagues, Trevor Grant, writing an article, and I think Jared Healy did likewise in the Sun. It's going to take uh, ten years to fix this mm. uh, mess up, and it's probably ten years now. And but it didn't work out, and you know for a whole host of reasons, and they never had any money. I, I don't think people realise how close Carlton were to handing the keys back mm. to the uh, AFL, mm. and you know in, in my time there, you know, I think they had uh, uh, certainly had three CEOs, probably had four uh, four presidents. Um, there were a lot of uh, a lot of changes. There wasn't any continuity, and you know, it was just something that you know there was always going to be somebody who was uh, appointed as coach who was going to do the donkey work. Yeah. Well, I was a dead man walking for a couple of years, and I I knew that. And you know, look, having sort of been have to tell. You know, so many footballers that they're, they're no longer service and no longer required, and and having experienced, you know, some uh, responses from players to you know slamming the door, to shaking your hand, to mm. to tell you to go and visit the taxidermist, <laughs> um, all sorts of responses. Did you take any positives at all out of your time at Carlton? 
Yeah, I, I, I accept and understand that uh, life wasn't meant to be perfect. <laughs> I can tell you that much. And there was, you know, I'd like to catch up with that little uh, invisible bloke who stood at the front gate with a sledgehammer every morning, hit you under the chin as you walked in. <laughs> and that's what it was like. Well, I know, because you, you were used to so much success, under 19 level, reserves grade, and then at, at senior level at North Melbourne. And you had 100 odd games at Carlton for a 24% win rate. Well, it was terrific. For the first 25 years in uh, uh, coaching, everything mm. turned to gold. Mm. Um, in the last five years, everything turned to uh, Cameron. Yeah, yeah, it did. Your relationship with Brendan Fafola, it looked like you sort of treated him with kid gloves when you got to Carlton and there was an instant response. Was that the way to handle him? Was it, does, if Brendan had been handled differently by all these coaches, would, would he still be playing AFL football? You see, there's so many opinions on that. Um, Brendan was a talent. When I went to Carlton, there wasn't any, wasn't too much A-grade talent. I mean, Brendan was, but he was a wayward talent. And he had his moments and he was up and down. And But look, I, I think if you, if you was, was just like a, uh, those little puppies that go for a walk <laughs> on the loo, you give them a bit, of, a bit of leeway, they walk out three or four yards and you know when to pull them back. Mm. And that was basically not so much Brendan, but coaching full stop, give somebody, you know, uh, a bit of space and see how they go. And if they, if they do it well, give them a bit more space. But if they jump out of line, pull them back into line. Where should he be? Should he be a great of the game, given his natural talent? He's certainly talented. And, you know, it was just so sad to see him. And, you know, Brendan was, you know, a, a situation where he got himself into issues that he, he, he couldn't say enough was enough. And Did, Were been, you aware of his gambling problems when you were at Carlton? Um... Look, I'm sure he had a punt and that sort of stuff, but not to the extent that there was an email going around with his betting shoot for one day mm. at one stage there, and I was flabbergasted when I saw that. And uh, I don't think that was... Um, I think that was when he was up in Brisbane. I, I wasn't aware that he, he punted like that when mm. he was at Carlton. I always get scared when I ask you sensitive questions, and one's coming now. The year's 2000. Your son Ryan is on the list. You give him three games, I think the first three games of the year. Mark Dawson, your long-time... Lieutenant of Chairman Selectors leaves apparently because you demanded games for Ryan. Is that story true? He left. The thing about it, and look, it's, it is a sensitive question. Um, Ryan was getting uh, 40 positions in the reserves at that stage. Mm -hmm. He deserved a chance. But look, um, in retrospect, I would have loved Ryan to go somewhere else, mm. and that was the start of my, the start of uh, my demise there at, at the Kangaroos. Um, you know, people thought that I had too much control, and you know, you, you mentioned Mark, and, and he was probably one of the ones who uh, um, thought that. Yeah, thought mm. that. Did you did you gift Ryan those games? No, I certainly did, did not. So certainly the vote not. at the match committee was for him to be in the team. Yeah, I discussed it with uh, with my loyal t lieutenants and that sort of stuff. If anyone was against it, why didn't they speak up mm. at match committee? Was I that much of a tyrant? I wouldn't let anyone to talk. Mm. Yeah, you know, we were pretty. Uh, um, you know, Mark was uh, chairman of selectors. They, they came to the uh, match committee. No one, no one uh, spoke about it. At the end of the day, probably the coach. Um, has the final say anyway. And I suppose, he, in theory, he should get his team, shouldn't he? Well, exactly. Mm. Exactly. I just wish the whole episode hadn't happened. Mm. Um, he, he ended up doing a pre-season uh, when he was probably 22, uh, the Bulldogs. And I can remember Terry Wallace ringing me and saying, um, look, um, we'd like to put him on the list, but he's, he's too old now. Now mm. you've got mature age rookies. Yep. And, was something you wish hadn't have happened, but that's life, and you know. I you, you've, you, you're one of a few that's had to coach his son. John Kennedy did it, and John Kennedy Jr. was a very good player, so there was no issue there, but I think John Kennedy stepped off, um, no, he was on the match committee, wasn't he, at the time, and removed himself because he had a son involved. It must be a, a, a fierce pressure well, it is. Coaching you, your son you, at you, AFL level. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. <clears throat> and I always reckon leaders make, you know, tough decisions. And it was a tough decision, but I, I made it uh, what I thought right. His form in the seconds were, uh, was, was terrific. Mm -hmm. He had the ball on a string for over 12 months. He deserved a chance. OK, he played two or three games. He wasn't that far off the pace, but the pressure was enormous. Mm. And I just and we had a chat, and I don't know whether Ryan, even this day, uh, thinks it was right that, uh, um, you know, it was, uh, was just going to rip the club apart, and it probably did. You and Jeff Walsh, in my view, both great North Melbourne people. You had a falling out, didn't you? Well, that was all part of, uh, uh, you know, when the contract uh, came. Um, he was the CEO at the time? Yeah. yeah. And he was, you know, Mark Dawson's... Um, Brother-in-law, mm -hmm. yeah. Look, these things happen when you work with people. Uh, yeah, have you haven't patched it up? <laughs> well, I haven't been around to his place for dinner, <laughs> uh, and he hasn't been to mine. I must say, watching you, and I've watched you closely through your playing career and particularly your coaching. 
I always had this, the impression that you were fueled by the desire to prove yourself and to prove people wrong and to prove that you could do it. Is that a fair assessment or not? Yeah, it probably was. I was, I was never gifted uh, uh, as a footballer and really had to fight to get an opportunity and to stay in the side each week, and I did that. And, you know, it was like a, an, was, it was an obsession coaching. Mm. I wanted to be successful. You know, it, it used to, to do an apprenticeship of... How many games did you say? 238, 238 games. Yeah. It's a 10-year yeah. exercise and plus another year at Essendon Reserves. There couldn't have been too many people who thought I could uh, coach or, or, <laughs> or get a result with a group of players. And um, I probably wanted to do that at the start. But it becomes, uh, you become obsessive at it and you want to uh, keep being successful. And every time you win a game, you want to win another game. And every time you win a finals game, you want to win another finals game and premiership and mm. so on. And that's probably, um, you know, Desire is probably the greatest motivating force there is. If you really want something badly enough, I think you can achieve it. You optimistic about the future of your old footy club? I have concerns, and I hope they're successful. Um, only one, th as I said earlier, there's only one thing that matters in the AFL: wins and losses. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to see them successful. I don't want to see any squabbling. I, I don't think it's a good thing when you see, you know, a president sparring in the paper, former North Melbourne president mm -hmm. sparring with each other and having a go back. If you're a coach, if you're a, a player, if you hold a position in uh, with an AFL club, you're going to be criticised. Just just take it on the chin. Um, if you argue with fools, soon people can't tell the difference. <laughs> so, you know, I know the girl with the curl. Um, don't pee down my back and tell me it's raining. I'm I reckon like, I said, I, that, that's become folklore, that. I said it to Glenn Archer once, and that was the, probably the only time I've said it. Every, every player who played for North Melbourne Rick, tells a story <laughs> that I said it to them as well. Um, it's probably not the case. No, they're good. They're, look, they're part of the, the pagan story. I mean, Dennis, I've, I've watched you play, watched you coach, had the odd skirmish with you along the way over 40 years. I've enjoyed almost every moment of it. You've made a major contribution to North and to football in general. I'm glad to see you looking so well, and good luck for the future. Good on you, Michael. Thanks for having me. This has been a Fox Footy production.